state secret that some of the world's worst pollution, noxious air and toxic water, is domiciled in China. The Chinese people are really unhappy about how pollution has degraded their standards of living, and they are no longer resigned to stay quiet. The Chinese government feels the pressure and gets the message. China's leaders are determined to effect change. Ecological civilization is now a national goal. But how to handle the natural tension between economic development and environmental protection, especially in light of the economic slowdown? How to overcome interest groups that resist compliance? More broadly, how does China's international commitment to control climate change articulate with China's domestic commitment to control pollution? What drives China's dramatic determination to create a clean, green environment? Finding out gets us closer to China. At the end of 2015, a historic deal was sealed at the Paris Climate Change Summit. The agreement urges almost all nations to put a limit on their greenhouse gases. As the largest developing country, China's contribution to the deal was essential. Though its economy is facing downward pressure, China promised to peak its use of coal and carbon emission by 2030. What's more, since 2011, China has provided about 440 million U.S. dollars to less developed countries to tackle climate change. In September 2015, it was during President Xi Jinping's visit to the U.S. that she announced that China will peak its emission in 2030 and launch a national carbon trading system in 2017. The commitment was hailed as an important step leading to the signing of the Paris climate change deal. Uh, China uh, hit two very important and critical roles when it comes to fighting against climate change. First, at home, China pushed the energy efficiency button very strongly, made the Chinese energy system more efficiently. A lot of hydropower uh, came in the picture. In terms of renewables, the Chinese renewable energy investments last year was more than United States plus all European countries, plus Japan uh, put together. But also internationally, uh, together with the United States, President Xi and President Obama made a historical announcement, which gave a very strong political momentum to the uh, COP21 uh, discussions. So both domestically and internationally, China played an important, positive and critical role. Joining me are Minister Xie Jianhua, China's special representative on climate change. Zhou so, Ji, deputy director, National Center for Climate Change Strategy and International Cooperation, and Ma Jun, director of Institute of Public and Environmental Affairs and a leading environmental advocate. Minister Xia, what are China's overall principles for climate change in general? So,中国政府在处理这个问题的时候呢,我们还是要统筹考虑国内,国际两个大局。从国内考虑呢,呃,我们现在这个十八大之后,要追求这种,要加强生态文明建设,要追求的这种经济增长呢,是 这个有效益的有质量的经济增长更追求更高的质量更高的效益能够改善环境这都是非常有效的措施所以因此说呢应对气候变化这个采取的中国这些措施不是被迫的别人让我们干是我们自己要干而且呢要干好 When it comes to pollution, I think the, uh, you know, we're facing a severe uh, air, water, and soil pollution, and uh, the pollution of our coastal seas. And the air pollution, um, on the air pollution side, 
more than 80 percent of the major cities in China cannot meet with the with our air quality standards and um, uh, for the water pollution uh, many rivers and lakes most of the rivers and lakes in the densely populated coastal regions got contaminated to some extent uh, but a bigger problem maybe lies in underground uh, the aquifer contamination uh, we now get the uh, updated data from the uh, from the ministry that um, nearly 60 percent of the monitored wells uh, the water quality is either bad or very bad um, and and the soil pollution uh, the new data also shows uh, nearly 20 percent of our uh, cropland got contaminated um, so all this means um, hundreds of millions of people have been exposed to uh, pollution hazards 中国已经提交的INDC的这个方案的目标 Traditionally known for its sceneries and delicacies, Zhenjiang in China's Jiangsu province is gaining international recognition for its low carbon growth. In 2012, it became one of China's 42 low-carbon trial cities with a carbon management platform using hundreds of sensors placed in every polluting firm to monitor emissions from the industrial companies. At the Paris Climate Change Conference, Zhenjiang's experience was put in spotlight. Carbon emission was actually a new concept for us. We had to start with understanding where our emissions came from. Over 80 percent of Zhenjiang's emissions comes from industry. But before establishing the monitoring system, environmental regulators did not know where emissions were coming from, using the carbon platform with its large numbers of sensors. Regulators received real-time information on how much emission each firm produces. The results? More than 90 highly polluting companies have been shut down by the government. With the help of this platform, emissions in Zhenjiang dropped by about 2 percent compared with 2013. Zhenjiang aims to peak CO2 emission by 2020, a decade sooner than the national target. This carbon platform helps us to analyze and monitor pollution to achieve the goal of peaking Zhenjiang's emission by 2020. Also, it provides data that tells us the impact of investment and emission on environment. The former mayor of New York City, Michael Bloomberg, now a UN special envoy, says Chinese and U.S. cities have much to learn from each other in combating climate change. He said the success of Xinjiang should give hope and provide incentive to other cities plagued with environmental problems. The good news is that the public, through their mayors and through television, in every country around the world, China included, tell their leaders, we want something different, we want something better. And the Chinese government is responding to that. China gets uh, close to 70 percent, roughly two-thirds of its energy still from coal. The U.S. is, I think, 25 percent or something. So that's a huge difference in terms of the uh, source inputs to what's causing a lot of the greenhouse gases. So that makes it more difficult for China, I would assume. Sure. So th this is a very spe specific difficulty and the challenge for China. So China is the only country uh, with the, the natural resources, the endowment. Right. Uh, so coal dominate our uh, energy mix. But even though we are thinking about uh, how to introduce more and more uh, clean energy, like uh, renewables, nuclear, and even natural gas, uh, to lower our carbon intensity, but certainly we have a long way to go. This is why we cannot uh, reach the, the peak uh, in a very short term. The central government have, have decided to adopt such a the toughest policy choice of uh, you know the reduction of the coal 
and um, the capping of the coal consumption, the restructuring of those dirty industries. This used, used to be considered as something unimaginable. You know, globally in those negotiations, these are the these are the highly restricted areas that uh, we cannot touch upon this. It's our rights of development. But because of the local pollution control, um, you know, demand by the people, these barriers have been overcome. Certainly there's a great deal of pressure in China to reduce pollution and protect the environment. That's obvious. And there is international pressure, which everybody uh, shares, to maintain uh, uh, the climate uh, within two degrees centigrade over pre-industrial con conditions, which is very serious for the whole world. Th these two overlap a great deal because the same greenhouse gases cause both. But is there a difference it, it, when you, when you add, if, if what China would do for its own sake to control pollution but still maintain development, are those exactly the same things that are demanded for climate uh, change control or is there some other kinds of things that China is doing for climate change that it wouldn't ordinarily do for its own sake in order to be in harmony with the, with the world agenda? Uh, certainly, uh, in theoretical terms, uh, you can distinguish the two. Uh, sometimes they are different, but uh, uh, for the moment uh, we we see uh, larger and larger overlapping area between the two from Chinese side. So this is why uh, China become more and more confident to uh, to take action. Uh, I mean, amb ambitious amb action for uh, for climate issues. So actually, uh, the efforts we want to make and to maximize the overlapping areas. In that sure. way, we, uh, we persuade the stakeholders to take action. Otherwise, it will be more challenging. People have heard the commitment of leadership for a long time uh, in terms of fighting pollution. Uh, nobody likes pollution, uh, so people have said how bad it is in fighting it. And it does seem that uh, the more people talk about it, the worse the reality is. Now, I know that's sort of a superficial understanding, uh, but can you understand the, uh, the feelings of people who hear a lot of rhetoric and, and just see and smell and, and, and feel the, the continuing contamination? We have seen some pretty drastic change, dramatic change of, uh, of public opinion. You know, there are all this rising public awareness and, um, and then that leads to the changing government policy. In China, I think there are Many people have a, have a cell phone app like this. You know, this is an app developed by us. It's called the Blue Map app. And uh, uh, I see a lot of red on a blue map. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Uh, it's aspirational. Uh, 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 but, uh, but you can so see... So red means that uh, it is uh, over the standard, I would Over say. the standards, yes. All the, uh, from the orange uh, all the way to the, to the black and uh, uh, different, uh, you know, uh, the color coding shows mm -hmm. the severity is getting increased. Uh, the, the idea of doing an app uh, uh, started uh, uh, from 2013. You know, when we see that uh, there are all this uh, air quality data available, but there are those commercial apps which can report this to the public. Mm -hmm. uh, but from, from the NGO like us, from our perspective, we decided to take one step further. You know, by requiring, by requiring the disclosure of not just the PM 2.5 data, but the, but the very source of the T PM 2.5. We hope that uh, the source data can be disclosed to the public. So 2013, we launched a total transparency initiative along with 25 other NGOs uh, calling for the disclosure of the real-time monitoring data of those, some of the largest factories in China. And we thought they're going to take years for this to happen because it hasn't happened in other parts of the world. Uh, uh, but to our surprise, the Ministry of Environmental Protection said yes that same year. Just a few months later, they decided to make that happen from 2014.
You, of course, know there are political issues in the United States uh, versus development and, uh, and pollution control and climate change. Uh, uh, there are similar kinds of political uh, discussions and debates within China. I'm sure you hear that kind of argument internally, and I'd like to know how you deal with it.吃饭问题 协调的越来越好，到现在进一步提出来，这个要加强生态文明建设，不光是就环境问题谈环境问题，而是要把环境融入到经济政治社会文化建设当中去。This time, you know, although we are suffering from such a bad slowing down, you know, globally, I can see that uh, the government has uh, has been talking not just to let's grow uh, the uh, you know the, let, let's do the business euro and try to grow out of our problem but this time they're talking about you know we need a a new mindset we need to understand that uh, uh, we're in this uh, uh, new normal and you know, basically we need to uh, give far more uh, you know give far more attention and uh, priority to to a more balanced and sustainable uh, way of, uh, of, of growth and development. Just to take coal as an example, where we want to introduce more and more non-fossil fuel, for example. And uh, so we, you have to face uh, the very uh, realistic challenge there. That means, for example, we have several millions of workers to work for coal. And um, what about the unemployment problem? So what response measure you can take to handle that? And uh, also, uh, in the past 10 years, our banking system, we issued a lot of loan to these specific sectors as the infrastructure sectors. But now you say, oh, we, we will not use the coal, and who will pay back the loan? So who will return? Uh, so those are some very realistic uh, problems. Uh, and that means when you design your climate policy, you should have a very comprehensive, very considerable uh, design uh, to, uh, to, to think how uh, to spend some money, to spend some budget for the, uh, for the uh, workers in coal to, I mean, uh, to address the unemployment problem by, for example, training or shifting to other sectors anyway the society, the government, should create more job opportunities for them, for their transition. Pollution is obviously very serious in China. The Chinese people are very unhappy about it, air pollution being the most obvious, but many other things as well. Uh, it is said that the problem is not so much the environmental laws, which are s strong in China, but the fact that there's very little compliance, that people just, and companies and enterprises, just don't pay attention to it or have mechanisms to avoid it. Um, do you think that's a fair assessment? And if so, what can be done in China to effectively increase the compliance with laws already on the books? 中国在环境保护这个领域啊这个应该说法律比较完备现在的问题呢是有法不依执法不严有法这个这个执法问题这可能是一个很重要的问题所以可能你们已经注意到了这个现在我们这个环保部他们在加大执法的力度这个环保部长讲了
所以有法不依，执法不严，最后就等于没有法。所以你要求这个，我们制定了这个排放标准，排放标准那执行不执行是执行排放标准，这就是守法跟非法跟非法的界限，所以必须要严格的执法。在这一点上呢，呃，我们这个这个现在环保部门在加大执法的力度，而且加大处罚的力度。所以现在这个处罚。已经是按日计算了，说这过去我在的时候，那就一个企业的罚款，我们的权利只有十万块钱，说这个现在他的权利就是按日计罚，那就没有上没有封顶，那这个力度处罚的力度就非常大了。另外又决定呢，如果你这个环保法，你违反了环保法，那有些问题要跟要跟刑法现在已经这个。在刑法当中也立了这个破坏环境的这个罪名，那就可以这个让违法的不管是什么人，你违法违反环保法也要坐牢的，所以这个执法的呃力度会越来越大。In October 2015, the local court of Nanping in Fujian province issued the first verdict in an environmental civil case. Friends of Nature, a Beijing-based NGO and a local environmental NGO in Nanping, accuse four people in the mining industry of severely damaging the local forest. The court pronounced the four guilty and required that they pay a fine of about 200,000 U.S. dollars for having polluted the forest. The defendants were also required to stop their polluting and plant trees to restore the forest. In addition, they should also cover the legal cost of the case for the two NGOs. I'm a little surprised to hear the court has ruled that the accused should pay our legal fees. In the future, if the defendant should cover the legal cost for the plaintiff if he or she loses the case, the environmental NGOs will not hesitate to file a suit. This is the first environmental case brought by NGOs since China's new environment law took effect in January 2015. The new law is set to be China's most strict law to protect the environment. Legal experts say that prior, most environmental cases were handled by administrative departments. This case is the first court case filed by NGOs, and it is a milestone in environmental protection. Some people would say that we've reached a tipping point where it's almost impossible to stop the continuing degradation, whether it's air pollution, water, soil, wells. Um, how do you address that issue? Uh, is is the situation remediable? Yeah, I think you know on the uh, on on the air side, it is remediable. We all know that uh, you know the air uh, pollution. If uh, if we stop it from the sources, and then just uh, we just need some wind blowing from uh, from Mongolia, and then we can have blue sky in Beijing uh, quite soon. Uh, now the the trick is how to, how to really, you know, um, change our energy structure and uh, restructure our dirty industries. That's the challenge. But but it is definitely 100% remediable uh, for air. But for the water and soil, that will, that that will be a different story. Uh, the water side is going to take much longer because all this um, uh, contaminants. Uh, all this uh, uh, polluting substances, which get into the sediment, uh, get into the aquifer, uh, get into the soil, it will take a much longer time to try to get rid of them. But I always argue we should still be, you know, never lose hope. Still try to do it because it's always better to do it today than tomorrow. You know, it's always cheaper and much much easier to stop that from the sources. Then to try to get rid of them, you know, when we release them into into the environment and ecosystem. How do you literally, physically going go about uh, uh, fixing the soil and deep well water pollution? Yeah, uh, those there are technologies available, uh, but sometimes just highly costly. You know, in America, they started uh, the super fund. And use that money, uh, trillion, you know, uh, you know, billions and upon billions of dollars have been spent to try to fix some of the uh, historic sites uh, of, of pollution. Mm -hmm. But sometimes the results 
uh, were not quite uh, satisfactory. Uh, but still, there are technologies uh, and new technologies available. Uh, but, um, uh, but, but we should not just wait for, uh, you know, to that end of the pipe solution. We should not wait for that uh, time, you know, when we suddenly realize that um, we need to uh, fix so much, so many sites that that will be not just be hugely costly, but it will it, they they will already they they will uh, they they will hurt people already. You know the the aquifer is uh, is the sources of drinking water for much of the residents in northern part of China, and the soil is the source for our food. And um, if uh, uh, we can't continue, uh, we can't allow this continuous uh, damaging to the environmental damaging to to those. Very limited uh, uh, resources. 现在这个工业化的过程当中，我们的技术水平、能力还是有相当大的差距。就是我讲我们这个能源的利用效率，中国的能效水平其实跟发达国家这个先进水平比啊，可能我们要相差二点九倍。就是这个这个呃技术上的差距还是非常大的，所以我们还是应该在这方面我们开展合作。Knowing how to reduce pollution is not the hard part. Energy efficiency, effluent controls, cleaner fossil fuels, alternative energy. Good laws are on the books. Obeying those laws is the problem. And a more confident China now has the political will to enforce compliance, ready to levy huge fines and make criminal indictments. Yet I worry that China's economic slowdown will undermine that political will. Because to continue to upgrade living standards, especially to complete the historic task of eliminating poverty, economic development must continue. The two leapfrogging ideas I hear are holistic and synergistic. Holistic meaning all-encompassing socioeconomic integration of technologies and diverse interests and synergistic, meaning that the pursuit of a green, low-carbon, circular economy can help, not hinder, long-term development. Moreover, China's international commitment to reduce greenhouse gases is just what China's pollution fighters need to intensify the country's domestic commitment to reduce pollution. The thing about smog is that you don't have to understand statistics to know whether progress is being made. Just look outside, or take a breath to get closer to China.